extend this welcome on behalf of the Bay County Islamic Society, and I'm very, very pleased and delighted to see everyone here today on a Saturday afternoon with the weather so beautiful outside. It shows dedication and commitment. My name is Hiba Abdul Rahim, and I will be the moderator for tonight's event, or this afternoon's event. I uh, want to go through the program quickly. I don't want to delay, uh, delay anything and take away from the time of our speaker. But uh, we are starting on time, and we'll probably end about 4.30 sharp. And then after that, uh, our speaker will entertain questions and answers. So please refrain and keep those thoughts towards the end. Um, at the point at which we break, if you're interested in quickly running outside and grabbing a drink or a quick refreshment, that's fine. Otherwise, of course, we will open the refreshment section for everybody towards the end. And um, if you have any, if you want to take a look at the tables that we have outside, there are books uh, for you to stop by and feel free to pick one up. Um, and if you have any questions, we have a fantastic welcoming committee outside. They'll be more than happy to help with any questions you have. Of course, the restrooms are out of these doors, and that's a very important um, place <laughs> to know the location of. And uh, I just want to take a quick moment to introduce our speaker. We're very, very honored to have you all here today, but we're equally honored to have our guest, Dr. Jamal Bedoui, join us. Dr. Bedoui is Professor Emeritus at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. He's visiting from Canada, so I'm sure he's enjoying the weather. He served there as Professor of both Management and Religious Studies. Dr. Bedoui is the author of several works on Islam and on Muslim-non-Muslim -Muslim relations. In addition to his participation in lectures, seminars, and interfaith dialogues in North America, He's frequented, is often invited as a guest speaker in over 38 countries across the world. He's a member of the Islamic Juridical Council of North America, the European Council of Fetwa and Research, and the International Union of Muslim Scholars. He's been a volunteer imam or a spiritual leader in a local Muslim community in Halifax since 1970. And a final note on Dr. Badawi, he is a father of five children and the grandfather to 17 little ones. Now, um, our topic tonight is a very, very interesting and very important one. Our president, Commander-in-Chief, said he believes that man and fish can coexist peacefully, if you've heard one of his very famous presidential moments. We believe that man and man can coexist peacefully, and Dr. Bedouli is here to talk to us about that. Welcome, Dr. Bedouli. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, all praise is due to the one and only creator of the universe, God, Allah, Jehovah, whatever name you give to. And I greet you with the greeting of all of the prophets, the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of God be with you all. In the very outset, I'd just like to say a word of thanks first to our moderator for her generous introduction. In fact, the number of grandchildren may be updated in a couple of months. <laughs> I keep it open in my word press, in the, my computer. And I'm very pleased to be here. Indeed, I enjoy the weather here. I still have batches of, of snow still in my driveway in Halifax, so it was a great bonus actually to be here, but more importantly, to be with you. The topic is quite involved and it could be all kinds of details. I try my best to combine or balance clarity with brevity, a big task. And as you note from even the outline, I'll try to give first a short answer to the question posed. We'll talk about a key important verse in the Quran that deal with the subject, try to analyze it, relate it to other similar verses in the Quran to show that it's not only one verse that we're predicating the presentation upon. We'll talk briefly about the threats to peaceful coexistence and deal more particularly with the area of hermeneutics, how sometimes people disregard basic rules of interpretation. By the way, this is same job is done to the Bible as well, as some of you might uh, know. And how some of those uh, mistakes result in disastrous kind of interpretation that might manifest itself even 
and violent type of uh, behavior, trying to conclude more or less with how can we join hands in promoting uh, peaceful coexistence, not just with fish, but with human being as well. To start with, my short answer, yes, just peaceful coexistence is imperative, possible, and feasible. It is imperative because there is no other acceptable option. It is possible because it did happen in the past, and it is happening actually in many areas in the world today where people of various backgrounds are coexisting peacefully and justly with one another. And it is feasible because we need to be optimistic even if we face challenges to that just peaceful coexistence. We can't help but being optimistic. The key verse in the Quran, I got the text for you even. It's in chapter 60, verse 8, actually verse 8 and 9. 9 is reconfirmation of that. It says Allah, and by the way, when we use the term Allah, we're not talking about a different God. Christian Arabs use the identical term Allah to refer to God. Arabic Bibles in Arabic is use the identical term Allah. In Aramaic, the likely language of the blessed Jesus, peace be upon him, is Allah, which is even more strikingly similar to Allah. Jesus did not speak English, by the way, when he used God and dear. It's even closer to the Arabic term because Aramaic, Arabic, and Hebrew are all Semitic languages with strikingly similar sound. We will not talk about a different God, the universal God of all. Allah does not forbid you, O Muslims. In regard to those, meaning other communities of faith, who do not fight against you because of your faith, nor drive you out of your homes from dealing with them in kindness and justice. I included the Arabic terms for a good reason. We'll come back to that. Kindness and justice. Surely Allah loves those who act justly. A few reflection, or I call it analysis of this verse. The one who's giving command here is the creator of heavens and earth. And being the creator, the command has an important sanction, not political correctness, not fear of violating the law and get punishment, punished for that, but above all because of submission and love of God. That gives it much greater sanction than any order of any other human being. Secondly, we believe that that command is, was, was not only to Prophet Muhammad, which we believe is the last and final prophet of God, it was the same basic message that was given to all of the prophets throughout human history. What is the price for violation? Well, accountability before God in this life, but more importantly, in the life to come. A Muslim who knows his faith would not take that verse lightly. Let's look more at these verses. What are Muslims entitled to according to that verse? One not to be fought against simply because they chose to be Muslims, like religious words. Secondly, not to be oppressed so severely that they are even driven out of their homes. Are these capricious? Are these special for Muslims? Or are these basic rights of each and every human being? What is in return for that? reciprocal rights for others who treat them in this reasonable way. One is to be dealt with in kindness. The Arabic term is more than kindness because the term used in the Quran, the Arabic birr, is the identical term used in the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad, to refer to one's obligation towards his or her parents. A relationship with parents is more than kindness, it is respect and love as parents. Secondly, the term kindness does not reflect the depth of the Arabic original in the Quran. Qist is not exactly like justice because in justice I give you your right, no less but no more. Qist, however, as Ibn al-Arabi, classical scholar, put it, Actually, it means giving something extra, giving you your full rights plus something extra, like gifts 
to establish good rapport and relationship with other human beings. It's kindness plus justice plus. The end of the verse provides one of the most noble motives for a true Muslim to abide by. Because it says God loves those who have this qist, justice plus. And there could be no better motive than this. Is that the only verse that we're predicating the? No, it is a crucial verse that scholars said it represents the norm of Muslim, non-Muslim, or Muslim relation, I prefer the term, with other faith communities. It is not the only one. In fact, you can look into the Quran, you find many directly related verses. One is the sanctity of human life. In the Quran, for example, in chapter 5, makes it clear that the Quran confirmed the revelation given to previous Israelite prophets, namely that killing one single person without due right is like killing the whole of humanity and saving one single life is like saving the life of the whole of humanity. Secondly, in the issue of religious fanaticism and compulsion, the Quran is clear. Many verses are there. This is only one of them that clearly states, let there be no compulsion or coercion, to be more accurate, coercion in the matter of faith. And that verse, unlike the statement made by uh, Pope Benedict XVI, was not revealed when Muslims were weak. In Mecca, there is lots of evidence it is revealed actually in Medina when Muslims actually had power. And even then it says no coercion in religion, even though you have the power now and you have your own city-state. Thirdly, the Quran, for a person who really reflects on it honestly without agenda, seem to instill and inculcate the attitude in the believer that, all right, you could have your religious differences with others, but don't denigrate them, don't only tolerate them, because you can tolerate headache. Accept them, not necessarily accepting everything they believe in, accept them and their rights to choose the faith they chose for themselves. In fact, the Quran says that if God willed, he would have made all people one nation, one group or community. One verse specifically address religious diversity. It says if God willed, all people on earth would have been believers, i.e. believers in one correct theology, right type of religion. If this is the divine will, who are we to force others the way we understand or the way we are convinced? Fourthly, the Quran speaks clearly about human dignity, not as a dignity that is exclusive to Muslims or any other person. And one of the amazing thing in Quranic expression, when it addresses people, that in some cases it uses the term, O oh, believers, but that is when it addresses Muslims concerning their particular unique Islamic duties the obligation to fast in the month of Ramadan and so on. So there is no sense of imposing on others. But whenever the Quran address universalistic values, it always uses terms that go beyond Muslims, such as, oh, humankind, or oh, children of Adam. And this is one of them. In fact, in chapter 17, verse 70, it says, God speaks there, indeed, we, means God, honored or dignified the children of Adam, a very inclusive and clear term. F fifthly, the Quran speaks about justice with all. It speaks about justice, first of all, as not a matter of political correctness or reciprocity with others. It speaks about justice as a divine command, as we find in chapter 16, the very inclusive verse that sums up the ethics of a true Muslim. Not only is it a divine command, but justice is demanded in the Quran even if it goes against your own interest or those of your close kins, even against your own enemies, because in one verse it says, don't let the hatred of others to you dissuade you from meeting justice. Do justice. This is closer to piety. Thus says the Quran. Six. One principle that disturbed the contemporaries of the Prophet, disturbed the tyrannical superpowers of the time, the Byzantine and Persian empires, is that the Quran constantly proclaims the basic equality 
and human brotherhood, and human, not believers' brotherhood. This is only one aspect. Human brotherhood that embraces everybody, that all are equal as the Prophet of Islam elaborated in Hadith, which is totally separate from the Quran. He says people are just like the same teeth of the comb. Nobody can claim superiority over the other because of a race, color, or whatever. One of the most expressive verses in the Quran among the ones listed in the PowerPoint, and I hope the file will be available to you maybe through the site of the Islamic Association here, is that it says, O oh, humankind, that's chapter 49, O oh, humankind, notice here, not all believers or Muslims, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, or it could translate, we created you male and female. Then we made you into nations and tribes, that you may get to know and recognize one another. Indeed, the most honored of you in the sight of God is one who is most righteous. So neither gender differences, color differences, linguistic, nationalistic, lineage has anything to do with this equality before God. The only ground for a, a human being being better than the other is the objective criterion of righteousness, a very big challenge indeed. Seventh, the Quran sums up the mission of the last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says, we have not sent you, O Muhammad, save as mercy to the worlds. It's interesting, it doesn't say world, worlds in plural. Because indeed, once we delve into the true teaching of Islam and its comprehensiveness, it does not only teach how to be at peace with God, or at peace with human beings, but to be at peace with the animal world, with the vegetation, with the ecology. If I have time, I could elaborate. You give you references that goes back to the time of the Prophet in the two primary sources. It's interesting that the Quran used worlds in plural. And the teaching actually involved kindness, not only to humans, but to animals and the world, our planet on which we live. What are the threats then to peaceful coexistence? And I'm not talking about threats posed by other faith communities. It could be threats from within certain category of the so-called 1.3 billion Muslim community. Many people think of Islam as a monolithic thing, Arab, Middle Eastern, even though the entire Arab world combined has a population of Muslims that is less than one non-Arab country, the largest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia. But many people seem to mix Middle East with Arabs, with Islam. They're not monolithic. They cover all cultures, just like Christians. You can talk about Christians, Arabs, South Americans, you name it, Chinese. So is the case with... Number one, the most serious perhaps, is to mix the normative teaching of Islam with Muslim as people. It has to be said honestly, Muslims as people, as human beings, are not perfect. At times they get closer and closer to the teaching of their faith. At times they get far away. Other times they violate it. But my question here, are there any other faith community that doesn't have that problem? Historically or at present? to try to understand Islam in the light of the action of some extremist is just like trying to understand the noble teaching of Christ only in the light of the Crusades, Inquisition, crime on the streets, or moral decay in some cultures. We have to apply the same even criterion for evaluation of fairness across the board. Teaching of God is perfect, but humans who are trying or not trying to follow those teachings is a different issue. Sometimes also radical behavior might be at certain points of history be instigated by the perception and or the reality of grievance and grave violation of human rights, inherent rights, God-given rights. However, whenever we try to understand some of the reasons why radicalism grow, whether it's among Muslims, Christians, others, it happens in history. And it does happen in many different cultures by various faith communities. 
that this should never be understood to mean seeking justification. Oh, yeah, because they're oppressed, so they, all right, it's okay for them to go ahead and kill innocent people. No, it, understanding is trying to deal with the problem at the root, not to justify what is wrong. What is wrong is wrong, period. Media, images, and stereotypes might be a major force in this. Media, after all, is a business, and business has to sell, or they will be out of business. And media cannot sell the constant news of what good Samaritans done last night. But when somebody is stabbed and there is blood and there is violence, that's where media thrives and attract the attention of viewers. Once they get high rating, you get also much higher price for your commercials. This is admitted. I'm not saying media does not serve important causes in society. But within also the restriction that to be in business, you've got to focus on the sensational. That's what the public would like to hear. Thirdly, there are definitely historical legacies in relationship between Muslims and Jews, Muslims and Christians, Christians and Muslims, Christians and Jews, you know, they all pattern. But oftentimes, many people don't realize that Muslim relationship with other faith communities, whether Jews, Christians, or other, for that matter, is something that is a mixed experience, a mixed experience. Definitely, there have been periods of conflict, undue conflict sometimes. But many people forget that there have been longer period of time, actually, very long period of cent or centuries even, of mutual cooperation. Examples are the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and also under Muslim Spain in Cordova and other cities where Muslims were cooperating under the sponsorship and encouragement of the caliphs in either places to bring together Muslims, scholars, Muslim scholars with Jewish, Christian, anybody, irrespective of their theological differences, to work together to contribute to human civilization that many Western historians say, had it not been for the immense contribution to science and knowledge in general under Muslim rule when they were for six and a half centuries the most prominent worldwide in cooperation with others, European Renaissance would have never risen. But many people even lament that that credit is not given sufficiently to the impact of Islam and to Muslim community in spite of their shortcoming. The other problem, again, is the focus on extremist actions. Five, the post 9-11 guilt by association and say no more. There are hundreds of documented cases where innocent people, just Muslims walking in the street, identified as Muslim because of their hijab or others are assaulted in some cases physically. They have been homicide of people perceived even to be Muslim, even though they were not. This is not right. This is unfair. This is un-American. But it happens. Six, there are cases we have to admit in honesty that sometimes even though Muslims might be instigated by people who attack their most sacred symbols, and distort their faith. But some of them react emotionally in such a way that violates actually the teaching of Islam, attacking embassies or trying to burn this or burn that. Even though, of course, this might be a small minority, it spoils the peaceful approach of demonstrating in a peaceful manner. But this behavior of the few seem actually to confirm the wrong stereotypes that some people have about Islam and its teaching. Seven, and that's the most important thing that move us to the most profound part, I hope, in this presentation. That aside from all of these factors, there are certain texts in the Quran or in Hadith, the word of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that were revealed or said in a particular occasion, in a given historical context that help us understand best its meaning, Yet some people go selectively, that includes some Muslims as well, selectively and pick on verses that suit their own agenda, whether they want to demean and demonize Islam or to justify as Muslims their behavior that, stand, that comes into conflict with what the Quran teaches. That approach, I call it the cut and paste approach. Any person with moderate intelligence can prove you Anything from any source. Just apply the cut and paste and put it together. You cannot come up with whatever you want to prove. 
right or wrong. You can prove the opposite from the same sources as well, depending how much or where do you stop. That leads us, before we take specific examples, to make a very brief review. I mean, you can have a whole course in hermeneutics, biblical hermeneutics, Quranic hermeneutics. This is it's a deeper subject, but just to touch on a few issues, especially in relevance to Islamic studies. To start with, aside from people who say that Islam is what Muslims do, that we have shown already that it is wrong, a very wrong approach, some people say, yes, but it's not only what Muslims are doing wrong. There are some scholars in such a and, such and place or century who had this to say, and they start quoting them. And they presented without understanding that in Islamic studies, there is no parallel position, for example, like a papacy, where the word of the Pope goes, have as much value as the text of the Bible. That is not the case with Islam. There are only two primary sources, which is the source of all sources. Both of them are believed by Muslims to be revelatory. One is the Quran, that is revelation by word and meaning, verbatim revelation, just like when maybe we can interpret the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, this is not Moses, you know, inspired, but this is the word of God, word for word, at least one interpretation. But in the case of the Quran, the entire Quran from A to Z falls into that category, not mixed up with, word, with the word of the prophet, where the revelation received by him from God was not verbatim. That might be parallel to some of the biblical prophets when you say God inspired his servant, so and so, which means just inspired the truth and the prophet used his own words. So these are the two primary sources. Anything short of that is actually a matter of interpretation. Even the so-called ijma or consensus of the scholar, there could be no consensus unless there is a profound basis for that in the two primary sources accepted as revelatory in the order, of course, of importance, the Quran first, and then hadith or the teaching of the Prophet, which must be understood in the light of the Quran, the source of sources. What does that imply? It implies that any opinion given by any scholar, no matter how pious or learned, is not a final word, is not sacred. It is to be respected as an opinion, but it is subject to debate. Islamic scholars in history, even when they referred to the primary sources, debated certain issues. They agreed and some disagreed and the others. There are cases when a scholar gives an opinion or verdict, like Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i, moving on to another environment or discovering new evidence, he changes his opinion. There is nothing sacred about it. In fact, uh, one of those scholars, Imam Shafi'i, said, my opinion is right, but could be wrong. The other opinion is wrong, but could be right. So very open, rather than, like some people almost imply by their behavior, my opinion is right, that can never be wrong, the other opinion is wrong, that can never be right. Look at their humility, and he was one, one, tops, one of the top scholars in Islamic history. Number three, there is also certain rules. The Quran, to me, is the only world scripture, or at least Abrahamic scripture, as some term, people use that term that is still available to us in the exact original Arabic language revealed to the Prophet. Not ancient Arabic versus modern Arabic. No, in the exact verbatim word. And there is ample evidence that it came to us exactly as uttered by the Prophet 1400 years ago. And preserved mainly by memorization, but there are evidence of writing from his lifetime as well. With that in mind, uh, the Quran may not require a Muslim or even a person from other faith community to know the Arabic language to get the general message of the Quran. It is clear. But when it comes to scholarly analysis of hot issues, war and peace, relationship and all of these, that's where knowledge of the original language becomes very significant. Just like many Christians or Jews would go and read the Bible in English, that's fine. But a scholar of the Bible perhaps we'd have to learn more about Latin and Greek in order to really find out. And sometimes they discover that things have been mistranslated in one version or the other. That's why you have various versions. Of course, King James is very poetic, revised standard version, 
uh, is claimed to have improved and corrected some mistakes. So it's an ongoing type of research. In the case of the Quran, the original Arabic already is there. So there's no problem even of ambiguity of what was the original and how it was translated. Was it translated right or not? This problem doesn't exist. So it, one must refer to the language. And when we look at some of the even translation by Muslims, even not only by uh, people of other faith communities, you find a number of errors or problems. One is an outright mistaken translation. A term is giving er an erroneous translation that is not born by the text. Secondly, even if you go and find that there is a lexical meaning, that is not automatic because the term could be used contextually in a different meaning than what the lexical uh, or, or dictionary gives you. And you know also that many words would have multiple meaning and unless you contextualize it, you could be mistaken. When I use the term run, if I'm talking about sports, it has a meaning. If I'm talking about run biz a business, it has a different meaning. We all know that. But this is even more clear in the case of the Quran. It, there are many, Arabic language is very rich. There are many shades of meaning and one has to look at it in a contextual manner. Sometimes a term that appeared to be general and inclusive, you find evidence that it applies only to some. When I use the term people, while well, people could be defined as everybody from Adam until the day of judgment, but people are you. I say, I spoke to the people tonight. So sometimes it's referred to a subset, and one of the biggest mistakes is that when the Quran criticized certain action of other faith communities pr prior to the Prophet, and they say, oh, but it says this about uh, Christian, it says this about Jews, but actually it referred only to a subset. Linguists say it could even be one person or a small group of people, not necessarily even a whole lot. But many people are not aware of this. Uh, an example of this. How many times you heard in the media that the Quran used a derogatory term against Jews and Christians and called them infidels? Is that true? No matter how much it's repeated, falsehood cannot become truth. Go to the English dictionary. You have two crucial definitions of an infidel. One, a person who does not believe in God. Another, a person who does not have a religion. You go to the Quran and you find specifically chapter 29, verse 46. It speaks about how Muslims should dialogue with the people of the book, which is a term used to refer to Jews and Christians. It says, don't argue with the people of the book except in the best meaning and most courteous manner. Except for those of them who commit aggression against you. That's the only exception. And say unto them, we believe in what has been revealed to you and what has been revealed to us, your Lord or God and ours is one and the same to whom we all submit. So here by the text of the Quran, it says Jews and Christians worship the same God. They might differ about theology, how do you perceive of the God? They worship the same one true universal God like Muslims. How could that square with the lexical meaning people who don't believe in God? In fact, the Quran calls Jews and Christians not infidels, but people of the book which is a complementary term, meaning, or people of the scripture, that's another, meaning people who base their faith on what they believe to be revealed scriptures from God. And the Quran confirmed actually that the scriptures in its original form <coughs> was revealed from God, just as Muslims base their faith on what they believe to be, again, the scripture or the book. That is the Quran revealed from God. But never use the term infidel, which has also the negative connotation. Not only this, a big surprise even to some Muslims. In view of the fact that I've read some Muslim scholars even in the past, writing and saying, but for idolatrous people, they don't have a religion. Probably some of you heard of that, right? Idolatrous people, unlike Jews and Christians, who are people of the book like us, don't have a religion. Right or wrong? Let the Quran answer the word of God in Muslim belief. Chapter 109, verse 6. And let me give you the background before I quote it. The background behind it is that some of the idolatrous Arabs during the persecution period of Muslims in Mecca came to make an offer to the Prophet, compromise. They said, why don't you worship our idols 
one time or one period of time, we worship your Allah, the one God, another time. This kind of compromise, like compromising two ladies competing, you know, the story about one baby. So he said, right, you take each half of a baby. There is no compromise when it comes to the oneness of God, period. So that's the occasion behind it. It was with respect to the offer by idolatrous Arabs. Yet the verse says, I'm not going to worship, of course, you're what you worship. You're not worshiping what I'm worshiping. Lakum dinukum. Unto you, your religion. The word deen in Arabic could mean religion. It could also mean way of life. But in that context, when it comes to the matter of belief, obviously it refers to religion. Unto you is your religion and unto mine, my religion. So that doesn't even meet the other definition that even idolatrous people have a religion. So the term infidel is a most unfortunate thing when we try to apply it in interfaith type of context. The other thing that is absolutely essential that no verse in the Quran can be understood in disregard to its historical context. Like many people just keep quoting right and left. They don't understand what was the circumstances of revelation of those verses. Another is, again, the issue of cut and paste. The Quran is not organized like the Bible, for example, chronologically. It is not organized like academic textbooks by subject. You move from one subject to the other. The Quran has its unique, and there are good reasons behind it. It's not haphazard. It has its unique blend so that in an issue pertaining, for example, to the war and peace, human dignity, is not all in one chapter. So you have to be thoroughly familiar with the Quran bring together all the texts that deal with one particular subject so that you understand them as a whole rather than pick and choose and go into all kinds of direction of interpretation or more accurately, misinterpretation when you have this selectivity in choosing. That's what I call textual context. Some people don't bother even looking at the verses before or after the verse they're quoting to try to demonize Islam or the Quran. And if they read only a few verses afterward, it would give totally a different type of meaning. But then there is something beside textual and historical context that is equally important. That there are certain values in the Quran that are definitive, clear, that we have just spoken about when we talked about other related verses. The concept of sanctity of human life, dignity of the human, justice, acceptance of diversity of religion, ethnicity, and all of this. And one, even if there is a competing interpretation, definitely one that is more consistent and cogent with all these Islamic values should take precedent over one that just talk about mechanical type of interpretation as if those values have no existence, such as mercy to the worlds, as we mentioned earlier, for example. This, with this in mind, let me come to some controversial, quote unquote, examples, five examples. Some people could ask this question quite legitimately, especially in the context of media, misrepresentation of Islam. If this is true, why is it then that Islam preaches holy war? To start with, holy war is an English term. The Quran was not revealed in English. To find out whether the Quran speaks about or condones holy war, you have to translate the English term into Arabic, the Arabic Quran. And then the equivalent of holy word is harb muqaddasa. That term appears nowhere, nowhere in the Quran A to Z, not even to any known hadith or statement of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I know of. It is a myth. It is not there to start with. Secondly, the term holy war is an oxymoron. What is holy about loss of life, property, injury, limbs, and suffering? Nowhere does the Quran glamorize war, even if it's legitimate war for self-defense. In chapter 2, verse 216, war or fighting is described as a hated act that might be better, of course, better for you in terms of the consequence of yielding to tyranny yielding to, you know, Hitler type, it might be better, not better in itself, lesser of two evils, better in that sense only. It's better than, than yielding to children, but never glamorizing. In chapter 33 in the Quran, when it describes how the attackers against Muslims in the battle of the trench finally left without fighting, 
the Quran did not come to lament that you did not really suck it to them in the battlefield. No, it says God saved the believers the trouble of going to war. In other words, if justice and aggression can be repelled without fighting, the Quran says it's good. It's good. It's good in itself. One time the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, noticed that some of his companions going to the battlefield, which has always been, by the way, if you study it clearly, has always been defensive. In, in a broad mean of defense, of course, which include preemptive strike against an imminent attack. Anyway, and he noticed that they were anxious to meet the enemy. He said, don't be too anxious to face the enemy in the battlefield and pray to God for peace. But if you have to face the enemy, then persevere in patience. So the ideal here really is not fighting, but settlement in a peaceful manner, if possible at all. Then some people say, how about jihad? Jihad is a very noble term. And I bet you each one of you, Muslim or any person from any other faith community, is engaged in jihad whether you know it or not. But unfortunately, like many other noble concepts, the media gave it a totally bad name, contributed to by some radical Muslims as well, when the term is used to describe acts that are contrary to the teaching of Islam. Sounds very strange, a long shot. Let's analyze it. Jihad is not holy war at all. To understand that, you have to go to the etymology. Where did the term come from? You have a root system in Arabic of three letters, like Islam come from SLM, which means peace and means submission also to God. Jihad and all its derivatives, verbs, nouns, adjectives, come from a basic root, J-H-D, as they sound in English. And you know what's the root meaning for that? is to exert maximum effort or to strive for something, to strive. In fact, one legal concept of Islam relating to, for example, interpretation or finding a solution to modern day problems that did not occur at the time of the Prophet and hence is not covered in the Quran. If somebody is asking a question about, uh, you know, for example, organ transplant, stem cell research, there was nothing like that 1400 years ago. So the scholars then have to study, have to be fam thoroughly familiar with the Quran, with the broad objectives of Sharia or the Islamic law, and then they apply their own interpretation based on this knowledge as to whether that's permissible or not. You know, that process is called what in Arabic? Anyone? Ijtihad. And it comes from the identical root like jihad, which means an, an exertion of a maximum intellectual effort on the part of the scholar to solve a difficult problem. It comes from the same room. It is a form of jihad in that sense. If you look carefully at the usage of the term jihad in the Quran, you find, and these are verses and chapters, so it's not uh, an opinion. It's there in the Quran. You find that jihad is mentioned sometime in the context of a spiritual purification. In fact, this is what is described as even the more difficult part of jihad. To strive against the base in human nature. The attitude of superiority, violence, hatred, jealousy, you name it. That's a harder jihad. Much harder than dropping a missile, uh, you know, 15,000 feet in the air or pushing buttons and killing hundreds if not thousands of people. That's harder to control these attitudes and unfairness, in fact, is a harder type of jihad. Secondly, there is jihad on the social level. In chapter 49, for example, it describes the payment of charity to the poor and needy is jihad with your money. Actually, it's the exact term. Jihadu bi amwali, made jihad with their money. And you know, it is jihad also, an exertion of effort. You know why? Struggle. Struggle against miserliness and apathy towards those who are in need. So you make jihad when you give donation to the poor. Amazingly, in the Quran, in chapter 25, it says that the Quran can be used as a tool of jihad. Tool of jihad? The Quran doesn't shoot bullets or emit missiles or drop bombs. What does it mean, tool? We can only understand it if we have some familiarity with Arabic literature, where it is quite common to say that this person is doing jihad with his tongue, jihad with his or her pen. That means 
make jihad with the evidence, struggle against those who deny God, the existence of God, with the evidence, the clear evidence or argument in the Quran. And yes, there is a third one. You want to call it combative jihad? Fine, that's fine. However, since jihad is an all embracive term that includes all three categories, you can call fighting also as one aspect of it. But sometimes the Quran, when it deals specifically with that form of jihad, sometimes it uses another Arabic term called qital, and qital actually means fighting. So that raises some question. How could a religion predicated on peace, you know, allow engagement in the battlefield? One has to go again to the Quran. Not radical or irradical. The text of the Quran is crystal clear. And I've always made that challenge. Find a third reason other than this in the Quran and please correct me. Quran A to Z. There are only two reasons given in the Quran consistently in different chapters that justify the ultimate solution if peace cannot be achieved or justice cannot be achieved peacefully to engage in the battlefield. One, repelling unprovoked aggression. You know what this verse says in chapter 2? I just underlined that. Chapter 2, the first verse, 190. You know what it says? It says, fight in the way of God those who fight against you, i.e. initiate aggression against you. And then it says, but commit no aggression, or it could translate excesses. Aggression, and by the way, the two meanings are related. Aggression or disproportionate response is bad also. Aggression or excess, for God loves not the aggressors or transgressors, for that matter. Bona fide, self-defense, part of our human nature, part of international law, acknowledged by UN Charter. There's no need to apologize for it. What is the second reason? In the same section, fight until there is no more oppression. And oppression is the correct contextual translation because it has other meaning also. Fighting against, and the verses in that simple four, four or five you know, sec, part section, five verse section, alludes to people who have been driven unfairly from their homes. And we know historically that this speaks about Muslims driven under persecution, harassment, even murder because of their faith from Mecca to Medina. They were basically pushed because of that persecution out of their homes. So we're talking about not minor oppression, severe oppression such as being driven from. That key verse that gives these two reasons is quite consistent with the key verse we mentioned in the beginning, chapter 60. If they don't fight you because of your religion, drive you out of your homes. Aggression, oppression, same consistency throughout the Quran. But even then, is it a carte blanche to have any disproportionate response to aggression? No. Number one, the Prophet taught quite clearly that you should try to seek peaceful but just. You see, justice and peace are the two sides of the same coin. One cannot survive without the other, really that you have to seek first settlement, just settlement in a peaceful way. And that's based on one rule of Islamic law known as comparing the harms and benefits. War is definitely all harms. So is there a way really to avert that greater harm if you know, some reasonable compromises could be made, not in essential rights that should be pursued? The Prophet taught that when you go to the battlefield, it has to be in the name of God, not in the name meaning of just my people right or wrong, whether they're committing what is correct or not. Not in the name of nationalism, narrow type of nationalism, or tribalism for that matter. Not for the sake of war, booty, because then it is not in the name of God. What is in the name of God is what abides by these two conditions, repelling unprovoked aggression or dealing with severe oppression. But then the Prophet said something that I dare say, that the Geneva Conventions, the fourth Geneva Conventions, dealing with the laws of war and other humanitarian international laws, did not add much to what the Prophet of Islam taught more than 1400 years ago. He spoke about sparing and not hurting 
a woman who's not fighting, a child, an old man. Notice a clergy, a clergy, unarmed clergy of another religion. He specifically mentioned the monks who are just devoting themselves for worship. Actually, you can translate it what we call today non-combatants. Even a young man who is youthful, he doesn't belong to this category, he's not carrying arms like civilians working in the field, farmers and others. That's what we call non-combatants. You have to be extremely careful to avoid hurting them. The Prophet taught the humane treatment of prisoners of war, never mutilating the body of the deceased or torturing the prisoners to refrain from destruction of what we call today in modern times the infrastructure of the country, excessive. He even said you can kill an animal except as needed for food. You cannot cut a fruitful tree for no strategic reason. And that's why when Muslims go for pilgrimage, they are taught that during the consecration period in pilgrimage, you're not allowed to pluck a hair from your body, not even a leaf from a tree, not cut a tree, a leaf from a tree, to just give that lesson of how to coexist in peace and harmony with the creation of God. Maybe, yes, I'll bet in, with this extreme form, but it is like a boot training camp in Hajj to avoid hurting even a tree by plucking. I don't know how much hurt would the tree suffer from, you know, plucking a leaf anyway. With this in mind, we can move to another, or the second of five objections. But is it not true that the Quran says, go and stay in ambush and seize the unbeliever wherever you find them and kill them. And some people even abbreviate it and say, the Quran says, go ahead and kill the non-believers. Giving the impression to the audience or reader that there is a carte blanche in Quran that those who did not believe in Islam do not deserve to live. So you carry your sword or gun or whatever, and whenever you find any of those non-believers in Islam, quote-unquote, just strike off their heads, lay in siege for them. Let's examine the quotation that has been taken totally out of its context. Oftentimes, this is presented in North American media and Western media as the reason why some Muslims were motivated or claimed to be motivated when they ran planes into the tower or whatever other action by that verse, kill Jews and Christian wherever you find them, or any non-believers in general. If you go to the words of the Quran in Arabic, leaving even history aside, just linguistically speaking, it uses the term mushrikeen, that this applies to Arabic term mushrikeen. Mushrikeen as a title, not a verb, as a title of a, a faith community was never used anywhere in the Quran from A to Z to refer to Jews and Christians. On the contrary, in chapter 98 in the Quran, in the first verse, it makes a clear distinction between kuffar, meaning those who rejected Islam, which is their right. Kuffar means somebody who did not accept Islam. Fine, that's their right. But then it says, among those, or imply that among those broader category of other faith communities, as I call them, there are two. People of the book, the honorary title for Jews and Christians, and mushrikeen. And actually, in historical context, it doesn't refer to all idolatrous people. Often, when it connected with history, it deals with Arab idolatrous people at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. No, nothing relevant whatsoever, linguistically even, to Jews and Christians. How many people are aware of that when the propagandists keep quoting selectively at, at will. Secondly, what is the historical context? I think this is the greatest part of lack of information among people who pose as scholars and writers. They just go to the Quran aside from its history. Would they do the same to the Bible? No, because there are respectable hermeneutics problems. Why can't we respect also the hermeneutics of the Quran? to get an honest and clearer picture of this. The historical context is well known. It has been summed up by the famous religious historian, British religious historian, Karen Armstrong, in her book about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which she have been much fairer than most polemical writings, much fairer. 
She said Islam was born in a very violent world. Everybody was ganging against that new religion for various reasons I mentioned to you. Islam calls for, for equality, for justice, and there were in, invested powers or, or of the leaders or chieftains of Quraysh and the big empires that found a threat of this egalitarian teaching of Islam. That was a violent word. We know it from history. The two super empires at the time, the Persian or Sassanid and the Byzantium, were engaged in fierce fighting against other, occupying other people's land, dominating and enslaving their subjects. It was a very violent word. And in that word, you need to protect yourself. You don't have uh, Van Kuhn, what is named Can Kuhn, when the Secretary General of the United Nations, or Kofi Annan, or others. There was nothing like international laws or boundaries. You have to defend yourself, or else you're lost, you're eaten, just devoured very easily. So, but not only this, but what is the reason why it says stay in ambush for them and catch them wherever you find them? Again, many people do not realize what happened historically. The Prophet, peace be upon him, even after the 13 years of persecution in Mecca without lifting a finger against the persecutors, even after they went to Medina and they were attacks upon attack, finally the Prophet marched with many of his followers in a peaceful march all the way from Medina to Mecca to just for a spiritual pilgrimage. And they had the attire of pilgrimage. Every, it was clear they're not coming to fight. They were stopped. And the Prophet accepted very difficult conditions, not reciprocal conditions, dictated position made by the idolatrous Arabs for only one big prize. He wanted to have peace, peaceful relationship for 10 years. That was his aim and sacrifice and concession. We need peace. Why? We discovered it historically now. It's historically, Islam spread much faster during the period of peace than war. In the period of war and hatred and camps, people would block communication with others, cannot listen to one another, cannot even dare approach one another because they might say, you're collaborator with the enemy. But when there is peace, when people can talk to one another freely, exchange their beliefs and thoughts, that's where Islam thrived most throughout history. In fact, in times when Muslims were defeated and destroyed, that appeared to be the end of it, like the ransacking of Baghdad, for example, still Islam continued to spread. And even those who attacked Muslims accepted Islam as their faith and defended it in due times, which is rather unusual in terms of the pattern in human history. With this in mind, just continue a little more with this. The textual content, say linguistically, it is wrong interpretation, and that's enough, but that's not all. In the Quran, as we have seen, said earlier, that there are, especially the last one, violation of this text of the Quran that are quite conclusive in their meaning, you're not supposed to fight people who coexist peacefully with you, the key verses that I mentioned earlier. In fact, the one I didn't give you indication about, uh, about is one also that appeared in chapter 22. It's not there, but it's chapter 22, verses 39 to 40 in the Quran. And basically, the scholars say this was the first verse revealed in the Quran that gave Muslims the right to respond to aggression against them. Which, and actually, it does say that. It says those who have been fought against are now permitted to defend themselves. certain limited interfaith marriage permissible. A Muslim man, for example, may get married to a believing uh, Jewish or Christian woman from the people of the book. It may not be recommended, but there are some reasons why that exception was made. And the same Quran in chapter 30, verse 21, indicate that one's obligation towards his wife, irrespective of her background, is to dwell with her in peace Love, more than love, because the word mawadda in Arabic is more than just superficial love, and compassion. Which means that if a Muslim understands the verse the way many people want to present it, he would go to his wife and say, honey, a Christian wife, which is legitimate, honey, the Quran says that I should love you and be compassionate with you 
and dwell with peace with you. But chapter 9, verse 5, tell me because you're not a believer, I have to seize you wherever I find you, and I have to stay in ambush for you in every place and kill you. <laughs> I can understand, I can understand affectionate um, seizing of one's wife or staying in ambush wherever he finds her, the bedroom, the kitchen, in our face, but to kill her represent a perversion of understanding of the true meaning of the Quran as a whole and falling into the trap of selective cut and paste, distorting the whole. Three of five, and we're moving on, and I have about five minutes, so I hope we can accommodate that. But some people say there is a specification in the Quran also that you can fight against people of the book. Yes, in chapter 9, verse 12, 29, nothing is swept under the carpet. In the same chapter also even it says, fight those who grid you about of the non-believer. Oh, here is a clear statement to fight. True, untrue. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier. People ignore the historical context and linguistically the fact that reference to a people does not mean all of the people, but to a subset. The reality is this, that it was not only the idolatrous Arabs who were up in arms to try to suppress Muslims. It was not only the Persians who did that and made threats about the life of the Prophet. It was also some people hiding behind the name of their faith who committed that. Some Byzantians who were supposed to be Christian did not act like a Christian any more than the Crusaders acted in the name of Christ. They were involved in the murder of memorizers of the Quran who were going peacefully to teach people the Quran. Some of them killed the ambassador or the envoy of the Prophet. In international law today, when you deliberately kill an ambassador of another country, that is an act of war, isn't it? It's not a person that you're killing. It's you're really expressing your aggressive in intent against a whole nation for that matter. It is in that situation that the Quran deals with those who betrayed Muslims at time of war, who committed those atrocious acts, not all of them. And neighbors, yes, the neighbors were the Persian and Byzantine history, read history, the emergence of Islam, and how they posed very severe threat and committed acts of aggression against Muslims. Furthermore, we go back to the textual context, like we said in the previous one. How come this can be understood in the Quran in the right way if other verses in the Quran called for peaceful coexistence, i.e. it applies only and exclusively to the aggressors, not to the whole community. In fact, some of you might be interested to know that this fighting has nothing to do with religion but with aggression because in chapter 49, read it, it's a very short one, chapter 49 in the Quran, it allows Muslims to fight against other aggressive Muslims. It says if two groups of Muslims fight, fought against one another, try to make peace between them. If one of them continue its aggression, you all, you all Muslim, fight against the aggressor. It's nothing to do with religion. It has to do, everything to do with aggression or oppression, which must be stopped. Semi-final. Does the Quran say don't have friends among Jews and Christians? I don't going to tell you some of the things that I saw in Larry King's and some people coming to give all kinds of statements erroneously and distorting the image of the Quran ignoring that most of the audience, in fact, or capitalizing, I should say, that most audience don't know Arabic, don't know how to go check on whether their translation is right or wrong. And they refer particularly to chapter 5, verse 52. First of all, there is a linguistic problem, and that's why we started with those rules. The Quran never said, don't take Jews and Christians for friends. I guarantee you that. The term used in the Quran is not asdiqa, which could translate as friends, but awliya. And awliya in Arabic is much more than friends. It means overlords and it means also protectors. Protectors. That is the contextual meaning, actually. It's not just friendship. Protectors, your own protectors. That means don't depend on your security on those other communities. Is that offensive to anyone? Every community does that. However, by trying to trace verses similar ones that says don't take them for protectors, you find that there is good explanation. They always appear in negative context. An example, if one quotes chapter 552, don't you think any scholar would at least read until 
55, 57? Just a few verses later, it gives the reason. It says, don't take the, the, those who took your religion for mockery, and when you make the call for prayers, they mock at you. You tell me of any rational human being who find people who are disrespectful, doesn't apply to all Jews and Christians, find many of them very respectful, mutually. But the category of arrogant people who mock at Muslims in the dearest and most sacred spiritual act of worshiping God. And then you say, you must take them as your protectors? There are other reasons I analyzed, and I'll give you also a reference where you can read that in full. The general Quranic context also is violated here. If Islam allowed intimate marital relationship, very close intimate relationship, husband-wife relations, with a woman of the people of the book who is a kafir, i.e. non-believer in Islam, would it not allow something less than intimate marital relationship like friendship? Where is the logic in that? Finally, of course, the other thing, okay, I mentioned that. Finally, and we're coming to close, so I appreciate the patience of the moderator and your patience. We're not much over, but this is important also because it came up in this uh, Gerrit Walter, uh, Wilder's uh, film. That the, actually, basically, they say, sometimes even openly, the Quran teaches Muslims go and rule over the world. Because they say there are verses in the Quran, I give an example, you can go and review it that Allah revealed or sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, لِيُظْهِرَهُ And I'll come, people translate it so that it prevails over all religions. And some people even understand prevail in military sense, that Muslims become the super rulers of all people in the world. As if, you know, like Muslims are coming. Remember, Russians are coming, Muslims are coming. They're going to rule everybody else, the 20%. A uh, weak segment even of humanity is going to rule over everybody by hook or crook. Anyway, first of all, linguistically speaking, many people who translated superiority are totally wrong. Anyone who knows Arabic, who come from zuhur, and zuhur means what? Something manifest or clear. The best translation for that I found in the popular one by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, when he says to proclaim it to proclaim it, to announce it, to make it apparent. And that's, that's exactly what happened historically. You might have heard recent statement made by the Vatican. They say we are no longer on the top of the world. We used to be the largest religion in the world. Muslims have overtaken us by 2%. Two, 2%. So it, it, Islam being a universal faith, second only to Catholicism, uh, not second now, more than uh, Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and second only to Christianity. If you take all Christians together, about 2 billion Muslims are 1.3. Actually, some go as far as 1.6 billion, if you check the Google, for example. So yes, that's what happened. That indeed, it became as manifest and as apparent as the Christian, for example, feel that Christianity is no longer an Arabian. Jesus Christ was a Palestinian, by the way. And so it's not a Rom Rom Greco-Roman person as the pictures show him, he was a Palestinian. But it, it's no longer a Palestinian religion, it is a universal religion. Islam is no longer an Arabian religion, that was the start. And Arabs are a small minority, less than, 10, less than 20%, sometimes some even say 15% of total. Yes, that's what the verse means, that it spread, not by hook or crook, or not by force, but God made it manifest. And then again, uh, the uh, Verses that we have mentioned earlier, no compulsion in religion, fighting only those who are fighting against you, and all of this definitely indicate that if you go by way of empire building and you understand that the Quran tells you to go and rule the world, then it is a very serious misunderstanding, and it all begins even with a linguistic error in what Yuzhirahu mean in the context of the Quran, in the context of how the Quran used that term and also the other verses that relate to that. Finally, I conclude by saying, peaceful coexistence can be promoted if we have the fir this attitude of fairness and humility, not holier than thou coming from one side or the other. Secondly, we have to reach out for one another to avoid being just overfed with poisonous, inaccurate, and sometimes deliberately distorted information, whether it is coming from non-Muslim sources 
or from some deviant or extremist Muslims themselves. We have to develop mutual understanding and respect, understanding our common ground and capitalize on understanding respectfully the areas where we differ. And like I said before, the Quran say, God could have made us all believe in exactly the same theology. Understand the difference without being polemical or offensive with one another. We need to engage not only in interfaith dialogue, but intra-faith dialogue within our own communities. Muslims will be obligated, and I'm trying to do my part. I spoke on that issue dozens of times, trying to indicate also to our own community to immunize them against deviant kind of interpretation that are totally unscholarly and unborn by the true understanding of the Quran and its hermeneutics. The same thing applies to our Christian brothers and sisters. There are people within the ranks of those who call themselves Christians who are engaging in very derogatory expression about everything that is sacred in Islam. So we need intra and interfaith dialogue. We have to connect clearly between justice and peace. Nobody is born as a terrorist, but sometimes the situation, social, economic, oppression situation, might lead some people actually to color their vision and misinterpret the text of the Quran, let alone translate that into violent action. There are many areas, in spite of our theological differences, that we can work hand in hand. And it, to my humble understanding, it doesn't contradict the teaching, the core teaching of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, or other faith communities for that matter. The issues of poverty, health care, uh, various forms of hate and racism, uh, the various violence, forms of violence, from family violence all the way to uh, international acts of violence, environmental protection, and all of that. And to conclude, yes, indeed, to go back full circle to the title, yes, indeed, just and peaceful coexistence is imperative, possible, and feasible. Yes, we face many challenges before us, but we need really to engage in joint action and mutual cooperation for the benefit of all. Yes, we can do it, God willing, if we take it seriously. So let's get serious about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bedouin. This mic doesn't work, it's just here at the show. Unless I talk really deep into it, then I might as well be eating it. Um, that was very enlightening and inspiring, and I'm very glad that I was able to attend. I'm visiting from Chicago, also enjoying the weather. And I want to turn your attention to Dr. Mubarak, who's, turning, who's handing out um, sheets. If anybody has any questions they'd like to write, you can feel free to do that. And maybe Khalid Abdelghani and Hania Hamwi, those are names, by the way, I'm not speaking in Arabic. Uh, if you guys can stand up and see if anybody has anything they want to uh, submit, we can collect those. Otherwise, uh, Dr. Mubarak, are we taking oral questions? Dr. Badawi? No problem with me. No problem. If so it's brief enough so that we can accommodate as many. And my apology for the length. And by the way, there are some references here. Uh, the, the presentation is based on a paper of mine that's available in Islam Online. And there are other material as well. So feel free to uh, copy the. And by the way, uh, is it possible to give the website of the uh, Muslim community here so that those who wish to have a copy of that uh, PowerPoint file? should be made available in case you miss something in writing. Can you give them the... Uh, I will find out where it is and okay. get it. It's the Bay County Islamic Society. For the benefit of our Muslim friends, could you tell us about the, the concept of polygamy in Islam? Because that's one of the criticisms of Islam, that why does it allow more than one wife? It's okay to have a wife and businesses that can have four wives. Okay, just in the interest of focusing on the topic, not escaping it, the full answer is given in that final, in that last book. It's called Gender Equity in Islam. You don't have to buy any books. You log in to Jannah, Jannah.org. Jannah, J like Jack, A, double N, A, H, dot org. And you find the book. Actually, if you go to some other sites as well, if you type even in Google, Gender Equity in Islam, there is the full answer to that. But I hope I'm, I'm just applying my ishtad. I would have loved to answer that question. There are lots of good answers. But am I right in saying maybe that if we focus first on the topic, so at least we come up with clearer vision 
because they could be all types of uh, interesting questions, but uh, for the sake of focus, maybe, with your permission, Jan. Yes, sir. Thank you for attending the talk. I have a question. 9-11 uh, was a seminal event in recent American history. Uh, can you say, as a Muslim, and after your, your lecture and excellent analysis of the Quran, that you personally, and every Muslim in this world, just as we all condemned the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, we condemned the Nazi attack on Poland, we condemned the Holocaust against the Jews, we condemn without question the murder of 7,000 Muslims in Srebrenica by the, in the Balkan Wars. We condemn the massacre at Dir Yassin. Do you absolutely, unequivocally, without any excuse, condemn the attack at 9 11 and should every Muslim in this world do so? Without excuse. I didn't wait for anyone to ask me to, to do this or prod me to do this in my own community. I think was the second day or maybe even the first day or first or second day before any uh, issue was raised about it, it was condemned in no uncertain terms, not as an act of political correctness or fear of anyone or desire from approval of anyone. I did it as a scholar or student of Islamic studies in my conscience as a Muslim that this is killing of innocent people in which our prophet spoke very much against. Number two. I have been the honor also of being part of more than one fatwa or religious verdict by the Fiqh Council or Jurisprudence Council of North America that did exactly the same thing. Number three, in Canada, I had the honor and privilege of being one of the signatories also of the Council of Imams that condemned not only this but condemned also the 7-7 in Britain. This is an issue where a lot of Muslims, not only myself, or a few scholars here and there, that if you go to the, for example, CARE, the Council of Amer on American Islamic Relations, there is a whole file of hundreds and hundreds of statements made by councils of scholars, famous authorities in the Muslim world, governments, Muslim government. And that's why sometimes some media people ask me, you say some of those people like Islamophobes keep saying, where is the voice of those so-called moderate Muslims? Why aren't Muslims speaking up? You know my answer to them? I say, Muslims have been speaking up, but not too many people have been listening, and those who have been listening did not report it fully. How many times have we seen statements in the big media, all the foxes and wolves out there that are trying to demean Islam? How many of the foxes and wolves reported fairly at least in some proportion, that represent the whole um, great majority of Muslims throughout the Muslim world, did they report those statements? How much time they have allocated to statements made by Osama bin Laden, Zawahri, this and that, do, who represent a small fringe on what Muslims believe in? So I hope you don't mind my openness in answering this. The media has done a bad job in reporting fairly about this. But of course, to be honest, I cannot tell you that 1.6 billion Muslims feel this way because I said in the very beginning, among all faith communities, including Christians, there might be some people who are still uh, bigoted, anti-Semitic, anti this or that. But I can tell you that the bulk of Muslims, I've traveled to many Muslim lands after 9-11. I spoke the same kind of things on, in, uh, in, uh, on television, in Bahrain, I was quoted. In Saudi Arabia, I spoke. In Kuwait, I spoke. So I'm, I was addressing people even in the, what people consider to be the bastion of conservative interpretation of Islam. And I found nothing by way of the general, I don't again say 100%, the overwhelming response of Muslims I addressed here and many other countries that I visited in the West or in the Muslim countries that they say you have a very sound reason, reasoning for that. They say, this is what we felt, but we were confused about all these things quoted and attributed to the Quran. We didn't know how to reply, but now we feel comfortable that there is a scholarly basis for taking that position. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for coming. I enjoyed your uh, lecture. Thank you. Um, when you speak about peaceful coexistence, are you talking about on earth or in heaven? 
Let's worry on earth, and if we have a good job on earth, inshallah, there will be peace in heaven. I also want to thank you for coming today, and I want to thank the Islamic Society for inviting you. We don't have a problem in Bay County at all. I'm glad. Um, I have the same question that Dr. Frank had, and uh, he already asked you, you asked very well. Um, but I don't think the West hears you. I don't think there are enough voices. There really is not. And we take that back to all the scholars and tell them they need to be more vocal. Can I just when say I hear you. Yes. Um, this man is extremely famous among Muslims in yeah. America and in um, Canada. And if you were looking for a scholar to speak on Fox News or yeah. CNN about Islam, and you asked, you just went around and kind of asked Muslims, who would you choose? This is the man they would choose. I believe that he's. And yet, you great. see him on television. And that's making, yeah. that's making this point. Right. The news of this media is, is not very. Even handed. Anybody. Ask, ask anybody out there. You know, they're just not husbands. And uh, I, I, I think they would welcome, at least not being on Fox, but uh, a lot of this media would welcome if you could have some Wall Street Journal, USA Today. I'm going to say, Bruce Harrell has had one or two, but they're just not enough. We just don't hear you. And, and, uh, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. It really is, because all of us I know are very peace-loving people. And, uh, and, and to not have you speak up, or let the rest of you speak up, and, and, and feel that these radicals are so wrong. I know it's only a small percentage of your, uh, of your population, and, and that they're taking the Quran and just, just twisting it into all kinds of horrible places, and you hear about the Taliban, and everybody thinks, well, the Taliban is Islam. It's not. You know, just a piece of organization out there. And also, if you separate this um, Muslim society from Islam, the, the society has a lot of things that are not part of the, uh, yeah. the Quran that are kind of extreme. You mean this society in America here? No, I'm not about in the world. world. In the world, yeah. You know, you know about okay. uh, women not being educated. Right. You know, of course, of course, Saudi Arabia, you could be speaking if you're Christian on this. You know, and I know that's kind of extreme. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to hear that, uh, thanks to God, that there is good harmonious relationship on the whole, of course, because you can never have any perfect situation, you know, between Muslims and other faith communities. And that's what I encourage. That, that's my message wherever I go. I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, I, I myself have been involved also in the establishment many years before September 11 of an interfaith council in our area, and we're very pleased with the kind of friendship that developed and better understanding. So I'm very glad uh, for this. Uh, secondly, I know my sister here might have given me more credit than I deserve, but I can only tell you one thing by way of clarification, not boasting at all. Just to clarify that these views, some people say, listen to this and say, yeah, but you might be just one odd thing. How many people you know, understand it the way you do? But my answer basically is this. Quite frankly, I can't keep up with the number of invitations I receive from Muslims, from Christians. I was speaking on an invitation of uh, St. Mary's University, not mine, in San Antonio, Texas, recently, a speaker invitation. I can't keep up, and almost, almost every weekend I'm traveling somewhere here or overseas addressing people in Europe, Muslim communities, as well as their friends also of other faith communities. Maybe one reason that I don't charge anything for my speaking engagement, so it's easy, <laughs> cheaper to get, uh, I get, get the greatest reward of human communication. But uh, I think my sister has been referring to one point, perhaps that is reasonable, logical to say. If indeed you get all this invitation, and you address Muslims from various backgrounds, including those who even have been conservative in their views. And then, as I have seen, the great majority of them after that come express their full agreement with me and say, even though we didn't know exact the subtleties, we felt that this is what is right. We were confused. That in itself is a testimony that this is not 
uh, an odd scholar's or a student of Islam position. The paper that deal with this subject was presented in a very prestigious uh, council called the European Council of Fatwa and Research, where it has many senior scholars, both from uh, those living in Europe and also in the East to benefit and have sort of inter interchange. And uh, the, this, this is a very controversial you know, uh, council. They tear every paper, just like, remember if those of you who take their, your doctoral exams, I mean, nothing passes like this. And by the grace of God, uh, nobody raised a question about the methodology of uh, interpretation. Nobody said you have misunderstanding because you also taught management, so you don't know it's not your field. In fact, it was published both in Arabic and English, and I wrote both so that there would be no mis mistranslation. I wrote it in both languages. It was published in one of their issues. So the, the issue here, again, God forgive me, and I don't mean boasting at all, but I think she's raising a good point that it is not, if that has an odd opinion, the first thing when I'm invited in one place is say, don't invite that man and spread the word. He's heretical. But the fact that this invitation keeps coming keep coming, indeed shows that aside from the extremist voice that the media keep quoting, there are a lot of Muslims who are perhaps very sympathetic with this approach. I just have a simple uh, question or actually a comment from my humble experience. Uh, last year here in one of the hospitals, a supervisor who has known me very well um, after the incidents in London, there was bombing in London by allegedly Muslim doctors. And, and uh, Dr. Mohammed Yunus, God bless him, from Bonaparte and Chippe, he wrote in the newspaper condemning that and so on and so forth. So I was really shocked when she asked me. She said, Do you agree with him? So it took me like three seconds, like saying in, in person, I mean, I didn't say that. How does she dare say that? Of course I, I, I condemn, you know, of course I agree with him. But then, I realized that we Muslims, honestly, and um, some of my brother, brothers and sisters might, might may not like my comment, but we really honestly are not doing enough job. And yes. I think my friend here, Dr. Frank, has maybe some reason, because see, we don't speak up, we don't speak out enough. A lot of people, Billy Joe and Billy Jean, let's be honest, in the communities, they don't know what the organizations care and this and that has done. They don't have access to it or the news media are not discovering it. They want to know what the local Muslims are saying. We should speak up more. Every time there is condemnation, uh, every time there is a crime like, like uh, September 11, we pray that honestly it doesn't happen again. We pray because God forbid if something happens again, we will be the next victim. We will be suffering more. So I think we need to do more uh, in terms of speaking out and speaking up. Although on the other hand, some people say, why should we? Like, like those people don't speak for us, meaning the extremists. We don't speak for them. Every time that the the, uh, the service did the this, we didn't ask all the Christians to condemn it. And, and many, I don't know how many Jews and Christians did speak against it. I'm sure some did. But did, we didn't expect every, you know, John and David to say, do you condemn what the Serbs did to, to the Bosnians? We didn't. But still, I think to be to do the fair thing, we should do more. Each local community should do more uh, at, at this level. I think I agree with you, and Dr. Frank. In fact, uh, uh, you're right. Sometimes Muslims are somewhat invisible in some communities. Don't be an invisible Muslim. And when you reach out to others, meet them on a personal level. I think many of these misconceptions would be clear. And you don't have to have a scholar. Just by conversing on a basic level, I think that could correct. But you're right. We need to do. More. I, I think we should distinguish between my critical remarks that I'm making about media, I'm talking about the biggest media outlets that reaches to millions of people all over the world. There's no way that uh, a voice like this would be heard. They, they have their own you know, agenda, their commercial interest and so on. But I think I've seen from my experience uh, on the local level that some media people are very honorable and very fair. I had several interviews in Halifax television and radio with people who have been very fair, reasonable. They're still professional journalists, ask the hard questions, but I found them receptive, not cutting you off, you know, or trying to be aggressive, shooting one question after the other before you answer one. Uh, so I think that's where, again, we can work with the local media. We have time for one or two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, 
couple of questions already been asked, uh, but the last comment really gets to one of the points I wanted to make. The, uh, the, the friction, the animosity, the fears that are out there, they're really born out of ignorance. And I'm not just talking on the uh, part of the uh, Christian community or the non-Muslim, but the Muslim community as well. Uh, what do you think, in your opinion, can be done where we can reach out to people both within the Muslim community and the uh, non-Muslim to educate folks about the, the uh, fact that there are really more similarities and differences between the two? Number one, through um, interface, reach out. I think that produces, I have seen some good results. Number two, I have been, for example, uh, just last week, was it last week in Columbus, Ohio? Athens, Ohio, sorry, in Athens, Ohio, where there was a dialogue uh, between uh, a good author, Christian writer, Dr. Brown, and myself. And we both, we're not, we're not in agreement in all points, obviously, but we were both in agreement of the basic thrust that uh, you know, we, can, we need to understand each other respectfully and objectively. And that had great impact because it attracted audience from across the board rather than one religious group or the other. That could be another activity. A third one is to work together also in action. You see, you can keep arguing theology forever. It has been done for hundreds of years. It didn't you know, bring people together. What can bring people together is to try to see what does our community need. From our own religious perspective, actually, motive, not just political correctness or to correct bad image. Have we as Muslims, for example, thought that we are part of that community? And the what, uh, when the community aches and there is problem, there is need, there is homelessness, poverty, and all of that, that we are part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. Once we work together, I think it would break uh, those barriers. So I don't, I don't care about the big international media. There's very, it's very difficult to, not, to crack the nut there. But we can work within our own community. If we spread the word, I think it would be a much better relationship. I can add one thing. Speaking to his uh, question, and Dr. Mubarak's, uh, Dr. Mubarak has been invited himself to speak at my multicultural class. After the class, and after he left, the students talked about how they did not understand did not appreciate, did not have the sensitivity that they were able to gain from his talk, discussion, interaction as an equal with them. So in answer to your question, if people who are interested in becoming involved talk to their local groups, churches, Invite yourselves to optimist clubs, offer yourself to whatever groups are in the community to spread the word of open dialogue. Thank you, sir. Unfortunately, very sorry, sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to say this is a very constructive proposal and I urge the community to take it. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time. I know there are a few other questions, but I'm sure that the speaker will be around if you'd like to stop by and ask him uh, personal or have a personal dialogue with him. There are refreshments outside, so please help yourself to that. But before we get up, if we can just uh, join me in a final prayer. We ask the Almighty God to grant us fairness, humility, understanding, and respect towards one another so that we may indeed live in just and peaceful coexistence. Amen. Amen. Have a great weekend. Thank you for coming.